Hello, welcome back to the MPL Weekly. We're just here hanging out, going over the weekly matches that we think are super special and cool. Want to share with you all the details. <laughs> I'm Beck Scott, that's Brian, that's Steve. See what I did there? I see, I see mm. what you did there. Nice job, <laughs> nice job. Uh, guys, uh, we are we are about to head into our third division. It's the Emerald Division. But also want to mention, right after MPL Weekly, you can stay tuned for the Magic Online Championships cast by some buddies of ours. So make sure uh, that you never, ever leave your computer <laughs> and watch this channel forever. Let's check it. The Emerald standings. Yeah, yeah. that's a great idea, Becca. <laughs> let's see. Let's see the player list. Oh, I I jumped the gun there, but yep. 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 we could talk about uh, how Brad and Yusuka <laughs> are about to go up against each other. Shoji Yusuka and Brad Nelson. That's going to be the next match that we see. But here we are, seeing their head to head. Talk me through. Yeah, uh, Brad Nelson uh, is a player who's had a ton of success, specifically in the standard format over years, and he's done so uh, with a very diverse range of, uh, of deck types. He typically tends to play more like mid-range style deck types, but here he's playing Bant Nexus, uh, which is kind of one of the boogeymen of the format. You know, a lot of players, you know, don't uh, uh, are very afraid of their opponent just taking all of the turns, and that's kind of the, the goal of this deck with uh, Nexus of Fate and Wilderness Reclamation, kind of digging you through your deck. Unta untapping all your lands, keep doing all this stuff. Uh, Shota Yasuka is a player who is also sort of renowned for playing very interesting decks over the course of his uh, his very storied career. Uh, and he is playing Bant Midrange, which is uh, very similar to the version we just saw Ken Yukihiro using. Really impressive lifetime earnings for these guys as well. Now let's see Brad Nelson's Bant Nexus. Bant Nexus, you see it right there on your screen. Uh, that key card uh, is actually Nexus of Fate. <laughs> One of the one of the uh, biggest. It's it's why the deck is named Bant Nexus. It's uh, true. Killer, talk us through this deck and sort of what the purpose of. How does it win? How does this deck win, Kibler? Uh So fundamentally, this deck is looking to use Wilderness Reclamation and Nexus of Fate. Uh, it you know, generates a bunch of mana with Wilderness Reclamation, can start using Nexus of Fate uh, very early in the game uh, by untapping uh, floating mana, using your mana uh, during your end step before the Wilderness Reclamation effect happens, floating your mana again, casting your, uh, your Nexus of Fate, taking an extra turn. Uh, if you do that once you have Search for Iskanta uh, flipped into Iskanta the Sunken Ruin, and in particular with Teferi, Hero of Dominaria, you can just kind of keep digging and finding more Nexus of Fates because Nexus of Fate shuffles into your deck. And you know, then eventually you can just use, like, say, your Deputy Detention to just kill your opponent, or usually your opponent just concedes. A beautifully powerful card in Nexus of Fate. Now let's take a look at a very different band from Shoto. Here we see Shota Yasaoka's Bant mid-range. We saw a very similar flavor with Ken Yukihiro in the last match we commentated. Uh, not a whole lot to say that hasn't already been said, Kibler. Yeah, this is very, very similar to the version that was played by uh, Ken Yukihiro. Uh, Shota and Ken were actually on the same team, Musashi, for the, the team series. Uh, over I the, think in they the, uh, Yes. And a uh, good chance that they communicate in some capacity because these lists are, you know, maybe a card apart. Uh, and, you know, going to be very similar to what we saw before. In this matchup, though, uh, one of the key cards here is going to be uh, Thrilled Mystic, giving him the ability to, to interact with sort of the, the big things that uh, Brad's going to be trying to do, along with Deputy Detention and Teferi Time Raveler. Teferi stops your opponent from being able to do anything at instant speed. That means you can't play your Nexus of Fate with your Wilderness Reclamation triggers. Effectively, your Wilderness Reclamation just lets you use your Escantas multiple times. Uh, so there, there are a lot of tools in this deck, despite it being primarily uh, creature-based, that will give him the ability to sort of disrupt what Brad's trying to do. Ooh, all right. And we see Nessa who shakes the world in the, the sideboard. I wish she were in main deck. I love seeing her go. I love watching her transform those lands. And this is cool. I don't think we're going to be seeing this in this matchup. This is much more of a, uh, a matchup where we're going to be seeing stuff like Disdainful Stroke, Negate, yep. stuff that's really just kind of uh, coming in to, to stop Brad from doing his, uh, his combo, essentially, that the deck is based around. Let's see if that combo happens. We're going to go to Brad and Shota's game right now. All right, we're going to see Shota Yasaoka on the bottom with Brad Nelson on the top. We have a three-land hand for Shota. Uh, Teferi Time Raveler, Lanoir Elves, Hydra, Crisis, Paradise Druid. It's going to be a keep from both players. Nelson's going to lead off with a tapped Breeding Pool, untapped Breeding Pool for Shota into a Lanoir Elves. Crucially, two Tameo Collector of Tales, and uh, that draw was great for Nelson. A search for Ascanta on turn two. 
Shota Yasaoka playing a Hallowed Fountain once again untapped into Teferi Time Raveler, shutting off Nexus of Faith. These players are playing at a bl blistering pace, Brian. Yeah, uh, Shota in particular is known for playing very, very quickly, uh, even playing, you know, controlling decks, he, he just it takes his turns at like an absolutely blistering pace. Brad is, is pretty fast too, uh, which is a, a good thing when you're playing a deck like Nexus of Fate, which can take a, a lot of time to get going. It's a very time raveler gonna bounce that search for Ascanta. Hinterland Harbor hitting for Shota Yasaoka. Gar Growth Chamber Guardian into Incubation Druid. It's quite a board that he's built up already. Brad Nelson draws another copy of Search for Escanta with no land drops for turn, meaning that Wilderness Reclamation and Tamios are going to be stranded in his hand. Hallowed Fountain is the draw for Shota Yasaoka. Yeah, and Shota's in a pretty commanding position right now because you know, he, he's able to, to get his aggression going. He has a Teferi in play. You know, Brad doesn't really have any uh, any way to, to get rid of it at the moment and doesn't have any sort of mana acceleration outside of Wilderness Reclamation, which Teferi is shutting down. And that four... X is four for Hydroid Crisis. They're going to draw Yasoka two cards, gain two life. Nelson is going to search for his Kanta, draw the Sun Petal Grove, getting him up to four mana. And a couple of four mana spells here for Nelson. Yeah, Tamiyo is, is interesting here. You know, you can Tamiyo and try to desperately dig to find something to deal with this Teferi. But, you know, Teferi is a, a big part of the reason that I think that Bant Nexus has kind of fallen off in, in terms of, you know, its popularity. Uh, curious if we can get a uh, get a look at what he's seeing. Yeah, he's gonna choose. Uh, looks like he is going to choose Teferi Hero of Dominaria. Yeah, so he needs to find Teferi in order to get the other Teferi. Oh, the and, he and he found he it. Does wow. wow! So that's actually huge because that means that he will have the ability to to get rid of uh, the Teferi Time Raveler and unlock uh, his other. Uh, uh, his other spells, uh, at least temporarily, specifically to, uh, the, the wilderness reclamation. It's it's not enough yet though because right. he's still under he's still under pressure here. He has the root snares, uh, which you know he he needs in order to to stay alive and can't use effectively as long as the fairies in play. Yukihiro are going to take that Tamio out with both his creatures. Hydroid Crisis is the card that uh, Vivian found off of her minus two. Search for Escanta going to trigger on Nelson's upkeep. And that is going to be a Chemister's Insight going to the graveyard that can be jump-started later. Hinterland Harbor, the draw for Nelson. And now, you know, this is, this is definitely a very tough spot. He has the Teferi, which does give him an answer to the opposing Teferi Time Raveler in the form, you know, the Teferi here of Dominaria. But playing it now, tucking the, the Teferi Time Raveler doesn't really accomplish much. His Teferi just dies, and then uh, Shouta will redraw the uh, his his Teferi in a couple of turns. You know, he does have the ability to get out the Wilderness Reclamation first, which is what he's going to do. Yep. Although, this is interesting because it sort of, eh. He's going to get his lands untapped, but he, he can't actually play anything here, thanks to the, the Fairy Time Raveler at the end step, right? And it's going to be a Paradise Druid. Paradise Druid coming down at the end step for Shouta, thanks to and his Vivian. And a third Paradise Druid drawn during his draw step on his turn. Uh, man, we were talking about the, the ability to flash in creatures, the ability to ramp at instant speed. Pretty desirable, especially when you've got a Hydroid Crisis off of Vivian's minus two. And I mean, now, the, you know, he, the, can I just use the Teferi Time Raveler to bounce the Wilderness Reclamation? So, you know, that, that didn't do a ton for Brad other than sort of force the Teferi to, 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 to minus, which incidentally gives Shouta a, uh, a, a card draw anyway. And that card is a Frilled Mystic, which is also pretty relevant here. Although, yeah, Frilled uh, Mystic is a pretty big draw. Although Shota's uh, got a big enough board that uh, Brad kind of has to figure out a way to deal with this if he wants to stay in the game. And, and crucially, you know, again, the, the Fairy Time Raveler shutting down that Root Snare. There's Root Snare normally you'd be able to just use to stop all the combat damage being dealt this turn. Very powerful against creature-based decks like Bant, but Teferi just says that that is not castable outside of your main phase, and preventing all combat damage during your own turn is not usually very useful. Growth Chamber Guardian gonna find a friend after adapting as Kanta the Sunken Ruin hits the battlefield after another card goes into the graveyard for Nelson. Sun Petal Grove is the draw. And yeah, there's just not really much that Nelson can do. He can use his Teferi, now tuck the opposing Teferi that leaves him with the Root Snare up. He still has two mana, but Frilled Mystic, the draw, stops at Teferi, and yeah, we see the Nelson's concession coming out from Brad. Shota Yasoka with a commanding start there is gonna take that game one, and uh, we're gonna get ready for game two. 
Two Disdainful Strokes, two Negates coming in immediately. Two Nissa who shakes the world. There you go, Becca. Uh, and then we've got Nelson bringing in, it looked like, uh, I couldn't see it quite clearly. He's going very quickly. Root Snares. He is, this is interesting, he has the, the two bonds of flourishing that he, uh, he is bringing into his deck. He could, ha he could bring in Lyra. Um, Lyra is a powerful uh, creature that can sort of stop a, bun a bunch of your opponent's creatures in its tracks when they don't have much removal, but that is similarly vulnerable to your opponent just bouncing it with its a fairy time raveler. Deputy of Detention uh, sideboarded in for Nelson. And it uh, looks like he's, uh, he's got some considerations to make here, Kibler. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, this is definitely a, a very tough matchup, just structurally speaking. Uh, you know, it's going to be you know, a, a situation where Brad needs to find some tools from his sideboard to improve things, because in, in the main deck he is he is definitely disadvantaged, as we saw in uh, in, in game number one here. The deputy tensions are pretty good. You know, they they do give him the ability to to deal with uh, Yasuoka's uh, aggression here, um, and as we've seen the the. Uh, utility style creatures like Deputy Detention are difficult for the Bant deck to, to really deal with effectively and efficiently because it doesn't really have removal. All right, we're going to go into game two here. Uh, Yasoka is up a game and will be at the bottom of your screen. Nelson, of course, on the top of your screen. Yasoka, four land hand here with a Disdainful Stroke, Vivian Champion of the Wilds, and Frilled Mystic in hand. Nelson is going to snap keep with two Wilderness Reclamations and a Teferi Hero Dominaria at four lands. Tap land for Nelson. Tap land for Yasaoka. Nelson plays another Breeding Pool tapped. Yasaoka draws a Growth Chamber Guardian. It's a pretty big draw. Yeah, Growth Chamber Guardian is very strong here because it gives Yasaoka a uh, a pretty big threat right away that uh, crucially also just le lets him uh, hold up mana for Disdainful Stroke. Uh, he could attack right now and adapt his Growth Chamber Guardian. I think there's a good chance he will not because he wants to have the, the ability to stop, say, a Teferi coming down if uh, if Brad has Growth Spiral into Teferi, which is exactly what he does have. Exactly. So going to do a Growth Spiral here, put a Sun Petal Grove into play, Bond of Flourishing drawn off the Growth Spiral, third Wilderness Reclamation drawn here. So uh, with all these Wilderness Reclamations in hand, looks like Nelson's considering just casting one here. Yeah, the, the Wilderness Reclamation uh, you know, is at least less of a commitment than Teferi and can often just get a counterspell as well because it gives you so much more mana to work with. And uh, crucially, Yasaoka does not have a Teferi Time Raveler in hand to shut down any of those shenanigans you can do with Wilderness Reclamation in the Bant Nexus deck. Definitely a, a, kind of a tough decision though. You know, do you do you just take this window, right? Your opponent has to have a cyber card effectively to stop you from playing Teferi. And, yeah, that's exactly and what happens. And there's a disdainful stroke. Yeah, he decides. Okay, I'm gonna go for it now. There's the, the you know, it's gonna be difficult for me to beat a, a you know a uh, counter spell if you do have it. And by uh, casting it now, I'm at least not ris risking hitting a frilled mystic. If I give you another opportunity to play a land, you could frilled mystic me. And Brad decides to go for it. Doesn't work out for him though. A frilled mystic, which by the way, Shota does have. Yes. Uh, Wilderness reclamation gonna hit the stack, and frilled mystic is gonna have something to say about that. Bye bye, wilderness wreck. Nelson gonna make his land drop and go for the Bond of Flourishing. We'll find no counter spells there. Takes a Tamiyo Collector of Tales, which Shota can see was revealed. The Bond of Flourishing is kind of an interesting card. You know, just gives him a little bit more access to key permanents uh, in the matchup here. Uh, also giving him a little bit more life to work with. Ooh, a uh, kind of a miss here. Yeah, Vivian Champion of the Wilds with another one stranded in hand. No creatures found in that, uh, in that look at three. Paradise Druid, the only creature in Shota's hand. Next is a Fate drawn for Nelson. He can cast it, doesn't really do much. It's <laughs> the, the most expensive uh, cantrip ever. Yep. Actually, he's, he's a, yeah, he can cast it with the Wilderness Reclamation trigger if he ch so chooses, and I think he might. He just needs to kind of try and set up something. With the second Wilderness Reclamation, it actually can start doing something here. So your Next is a Fate, you know, he could really use something that can give him a, a, a you know, profitable use of this Wilderness Reclamation. Temple Garden is not really going to be the most profitable use of it, although the Tamiyo uh, can probably dig for a Nexus if you really want to. A uh, lot of things Tamiyo can dig for, but uh, Nelson's deck is pretty large, and that's only look at four cards. Yeah, Tamiyo is, is pretty unlikely to hit any specific card. Um, 
does fill up the graveyard, so if he finds Search for Escanta, he can pretty much immediately get Escanta online, which is obviously very powerful, especially with multiple Wilderness Reclamations. But uh, Shouta is trying to make sure that Brad does not get that time. The one thing that Tamio cannot get from the graveyard, of course, is Nexus of Fate, because it gets shuffled into the deck when it goes mm -hmm. in the graveyard from anywhere. If you have time, Tamiyo can definitely find you what you need because it can dump things into the yard and then, okay, well... Two I... Nexus of Fates. Whoa. Wow. <laughs> oops, an oops oh, from Shota. Wow. That's a crazy find. And with the Wilderness Reclamation and a second one with Tamiyo, this is going to start to be really powerful for Brad. And uh, Shota notably has no way to interact. No, here. there's this is this is basically Brad, you know, having the the luxury of, of multiple turns. There's a search for Escanta that hit the bin too, so Tamio can can regrow search for Escanta. Uh, Brad can play Wilderness Reclamation and untap his lands, play the Nexus of Fate, and then start taking turns with multiple Wilderness Reclamations and Escanta the Sunken Ruin, which can just continue to chain Nexus of Fates. So this is uh, this is Nelson potentially comboing off here with Nexus of Fate and uh, and man, what what a Tamio find, Brian. Those two Nexus of Fates from the last turn. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was that was absolutely huge for Brad Nelson. There, you were saying, yeah, you know, Tamio is unlikely to find you a specific card, and then it found him not one but two. And frankly, he needed two because he needs to actually t he needed to take that turn to kind of reset up and then get this turn to really establish the possibility of even just like fully looping. Interesting. Uh, looks like Nelson huh. is just going to Nexus main phase. I'm, cu I'm uh, curious. Plus Tamio looking for something. Interesting. Choosing Nexus again. Nexus of Fate and whiffs on Nexus. Going to play the Hallowed Fountain tapped. Yeah, we're uh, going to do Brad's perspective here since he's going to be doing a lot of stuff. A lot of things, quite likely. <laughs> Untapping the lands. Blast Zone is the draw. And Blast Zone. Uh, for, for those who may not be familiar with it, uh, it is a land that can destroy permanence of a particular casting cost by putting uh, counters on it. Uh, you spend mana to put counters into the Blast Zone. Works very well with Wilderness Reclamation because you can tap the Blast Zone to put the counters on it, immediately untap it with Wilderness Reclamation, and set it off. It's actually a very powerful addition um, to the, the Bant Nexus deck. It does give you the ability to deal uh, with problematic permanence that uh, you, you often you know, would have to play uh, various like bounce spells in the past. I think Brad's in a, in a pretty strong position here. Return target graveyard from your hand, going to Tamio for search for his Kanta. And, and I'm a little bit surprised he, he didn't do this last turn. And this is sort of what I was what I was expecting, and you know, I I not sure what the thought process was necessarily because now you can search and play Wilderness Reclamation, but if he had he, if he had done this last turn, I believe he could have he could have minus the Tamio. Gotten the search, played the search with the second reclamation, cast the nexus, and then started his turn with Escanta. It looks like Brad is going to go ahead and put two counters onto Blast Zone. Wilderness Reclamation is going to untap everything. And Blast Zone is now live. Paradise Druid going to get flashed in from Vivian Champion of the Wild. Shota finally gets to take his turn. Uh, Vivian going to minus two, try to find something once again. And Disdainful Stroke is the draw for Shota, which is pretty big. Paradise Druid, at least it's a creature, but uh, Vivian is going to hit the bin for another one to be played. The Disdainful Stroke is a pretty big deal uh, for Shota here. It does give him the ability to to stop a, an individual um, Nexus of Fate or a Teferi. Uh, so it was a very important thing for him to find. Vivian's going to say, let's take another spin, see if we can find another creature. Finds another creature, it is another mana creature. It's also another two-cost creature when there's a blast zone with two counters on it at the moment. Feels bad. Yeah. Feels pretty bad. And looks right, like gonna... Tamio is going to hit the bin here. All right. All right. Well, Brad's thinking about whether he wants to pop this blast zone, I believe. Blast Zone right now, it's non-land permanence with that cost, right? It would kill a search for Escanta? It would, I believe. So I, I, I would be surprised if he chose to pop that at the, before that yeah. flips into a land. <laughs> Gonna go to his turn. Upkeep trigger for search, as, search for Escanta. What do you know? We found Escanta. Very Nexus of Fate on the top. With, uh, ooh. 
Okay. And so we've got uh, Ascanta the Sunken Ruin, which notably can dig for non-creature, non-land cards. Mm -hmm. And is especially powerful with Wilderness Reclamation. And this is actually a pretty, a pretty powerful test spell to you know, possibly resolve this Nexus of Fate, because if uh, this resolves, it gives Brad additional looks with that Ascanta for more spells. And so the, now, yeah, the bait's going to work. The Stainful Stroke's going to hit it. I mean, it's it's, it's interesting because, like, yes, it's bait, but it, it may even be, like, long-term if the game goes, like, a, a few turns, more powerful than an individual Nexus of Fate. And of note, that is the second Wilderness Reclamation to hit the bin. Mm -hmm. uh, so Brad only has one more left in the deck, uh, barring any Tamiyo shenanigans of getting one back. But Crucy already has one in play. Yes. And yeah, he, uh, he doesn't necessarily need more than one when you have a lot of land, and uh, that he does. Wilderness Recl Reclamation Trigger is going to go on the stack as Kanta Trigger before the untap. Another, Another Nexus, Nexus of, fate. of Fate. Wow. Floating some mana. And I believe Untapping it looks like he has lands. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So can he Nexus of Fate and... Yeah, I think he can Nexus of Fate and, and Ascanta, Ascanta here. again. Wow. So this is, this is really where things get totally nuts. That you just kind of start... And yeah, there's Nexus. Nexus of Fate. So here's where the deck starts to go off, and we're gonna we're gonna see Brad Nelson take a lot of turns. Deputy yeah, we'll, detention. Well, let's is just the forget draw. Yasuka's here. We'll <laughs> we'll remove his perspective entirely. You know, another he's not gonna be doing anything. Fate. So another Nexus of Fate revealed from his Kanta the Sunken Ruin. Brad will of course put that into his hand. Gonna go ahead and end the turn with three Nexus of Fate in hand. Blast Zone adding uh, a few counters. Looks like. I do want to say it's a little ironic that Brad's avatar is Domri. It's like he's the one who's just like smash all this, you know, <laughs> Azorius nonsense. It's like, dude, you're going to play a deputy of detention while taking all the turn. <laughs> you're not smashing anything. Growth Spiral is the only non-creature, non-land card to hit. Use that Growth Spiral to draw a card. It's a blast zone. Put it right into play. Pass to his next turn. Temple Garden's the draw with two Nexus of Fate in hand. As Kanta the Sunken Ruin has been activated, Bond of Flourishing Roots Snare, Chemister's Insight. Chemister's Insight notably can draw him a number of cards, hopefully digging closer to that. That Teferi to hopefully ramp up to that Teferi emblem and end the game. We're going to see a lot of, uh, a lot of triggers, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of turns, <laughs> a lot of Ascanta activations. This is where, like, if you're just kind of playing a game on ladder, you might be like, okay, okay, fine, I can see it. You have a bunch of extra turns coming up. You're gonna keep keep digging, keep doing all these things. But uh, this isn't ladder. This is this is the Magic Pro League. There's a lot at stake for these players. And uh, Nelson, uh, wow, what? is actually the concession anyway. It is. Wow. Okay. So Shelta, wow. despite this being a very high, uh, you know, high. <laughs> high Pressure, high-profile event is going to say, I have had enough. All right, Shota. I don't blame him. Shota, and I appreciate that. That's good, right? It's like you want to, you want to, you want to get the get your games in, but yeah. you want them, you want to actually be playing Magic in some ways. <laughs> uh, so we've got Nelson sideboard. Uh, Shota didn't sideboard all that significantly. Nelson it looks like he has a couple of decisions to make here. Uh, God Eternal Tech Kevnet going to come in. New card from War of the Spark, the God Eternal. That is a four-five flyer. Reveal a uh, when you draw your first card for the turn. Reveal it. Uh, if it is an instant or sorcery, you copy it, and the copy costs two less to cast. Mm -hmm. I, I think this this sort of alternate sideboarding strategy here you know, may have something to do with just the fact that uh, you know, he, what he has seen from uh, Shauta in the first game, uh, you know, and, and sort of trying to figure out you know how best to uh, to kind of catch him off guard with uh, precisely how he is taking uh, his deck's direction. You know, we see like Root Snares hitting the sideboard, and that's a, you know, a key card against a lot of creature-based decks, but when your opponent's playing a creature-based deck with Teferi Time Raveler, with Counter Magic, it can be very difficult to rely on. Shota going to take a mulligan at 2-6 here. Going to keep a hand with two Llanowar Elves and negate and three lands. Brad has a Search for his Kanta, two Tamiyo Collector of Tales, and four lands to start. Shota's going to shock himself and put a Lanoir Elves into play. Brad going to put a Temple Garden into play tapped. Ooh, Vivian is a very good draw for Shota here. He needs to find some, some significant threats. The W Detention uh, on the opposing side is pretty annoying because he does have a pair of Lanoir Elves, but he finds his own W Detention uh, that he can, uh, he can use. Search for his Kanta, going to hit the battlefield. Vivian plussing on Lanoir Elves. And of course, Shota can just sit back, uh, play his land, and wait to flash some stuff yep. in. No reason to play any of these uh, any of these creatures during your own turn when you have that Vivian up. 
He could just want to use the deputy detention on the, uh, the search for his Kanta, but I, I feel like he, he may be sort of waiting, uh, biding his time to at least sort of uh, use that during the end step so they can't just deputy detention right back. Two deputy detention now for Nelson. That was his uh, draw step. Kept it on top with search for his Kanta. Deputy detention going to target Vivian, champion of the wilds here. And, and uh, Shota's got a decision here. Yeah, he can use, his, he, if he's going to do something, he has to do it now, because if his Vivian gets uh, removed, he can no longer play anything against its speed. So uh, the deputy detention, you know, would remove Vivian, but doesn't because the deputy uh, never actually uh, stays in play for its trigger. It's only remove it while this is in play. So the trigger never resolves with it in play. So and it's the battle it of the deputies here with uh, a deputy detention being found off of Vivian's minus two. Shota going to crash in for three and play a Sun Petal Grove for land? No, Hinterland Harbor. Yeah, and now he has either Deputy Detention or Negate uh, available. Nexus of Fate is the draw for Nelson after binning a land off the top with Search for his Kanta. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, Nelson, he can use his Deputy Detention here that you know, would just be possibly answered by another <laughs> Deputy Detention. Uh, Atamio could be just answered by a negate. Looks like he's going into the tank here. Yep, definitely uh, trying to sort out exactly how he wants to navigate this. Quite a few options. So if you're Shota here, you've got the negate up. What are you what are you looking to save that negate for? Are you just gonna negate anything that Nelson plays that uh it, like Tomio, for example? It, I mean it looks like that that's what he's choosing. Uh Tomio you know, does have a lot of loyalty and does run the risk of your opponent finding more powerful things. But at the same time, you don't really have much else going on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if your opponent say plays Teferi, you you'd be very happy if you, you know, had a uh a negate available for that, but at the same time, you know, you don't want to give, let your opponent find it to fair if they don't, and you're, you're largely relying on on uh, just sort of beating your opponent before they assemble everything. Well, and a uh, this this damage that Brad's taking is certainly adding up, right? The Even though they're only 1-3s, 2-1-1 land or elves, uh, Brad's at 11. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah. Pretty healthy, but, uh, you know, starting to starting to get down closer to uh, needing to needing to make something happen. Right, there, the deputy comes down and going to exile the deputy. He's going to target the deputy, which would put another deputy into play. Right. And which is which is interesting, because if this resolves, Shouta can just deputy back, which is now this deputy comes into play, targets the Lanor Elves, but now deputy can come down, hit both deputies. So he hits deputies, and then he gets his deputy back and gets to hit search for his Kanta <laughs> as well. <laughs> oh, deputy of detention. There's some, there's some craziness going on here. I'm having memories of when uh, Detention Sphere from Return to Ravnica was played in standard, and uh, and you would get crazy, crazy lines like this. Well, the, the funny thing is, if, if this deputy hits Vivian, if he targets Vivian with this, I guess you still can't let it go because you, uh, yeah, it's going to target that. Getting the two for one seems pretty important here. I mean, it, it's ultimately not going to, to do anything because of the deputy if he chooses to use it here, which I, I suspect he will. Yeah, going to play an incubation druid. Let it resolve. Which doesn't necessarily matter at this point, but yeah, and we're gonna see deputy yep. come out, and yes, wow. deputy will hit two deputies, and the which search gets for your deputy and your elves back, and hits the search for Escanta when your deputy comes back. What a blowout! And, and now uh, with the we're gonna see a minus of the Vivian. He can try and find just a frilled mystic, for instance. Uh, another, <laughs> another deputy, deputy. of detention. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, but now, going to adapt the incubation druid and just send in for seven damage here, putting uh, Brad Nelson down to just four life. Oof. And Brad, he doesn't have the mana to even cast the Nexus of Fate. He does have the Blast Zone, but it only has one counter. There's a Wilderness Reclamation, but I don't, I don't think this... I believe it's gonna one do mana it. short yeah, to cast could, the Nexus. Yeah, he could. No, he, he needs to be able to... Well, no, he actually he can with the Wilderness Reclamation. He can cast Nexus of Fate, right? He, pot, he casts Wilderness Reclamation now, and then he has he floats two. 
Gets to cast an Nexus to Fate. Right. Oh, and then he can actually use the Blast Zone during, oh, his, yeah. during his extra turn. Which would uh, which would get rid of the Deputy of Detention. Right. Yeah, a second Blast oh, Zone. Oh my god. Wow, this, is... <laughs> wow, this, uh, this, this, this turned around on a yeah, dime. Yeah, the, the Wilderness Reclamation here. So with the second Blast Zone drawn, two, he can, if he... Hmm. He actually only needs to get the deputy detentions, right? He can he can put three counters on Blast Zone, or two counters on Blast Zone, untap it, fire it off, kill both deputy detentions, deputy detentions come back, remove the Lanor Elves and the Incubation Druid. And we're seeing just the, the, the sheer power of Blast Zone in this deck in combination with Wilderness Reclamation. This is crazy. All right, so Brad has put the counters on his first Blast Zone in order to use it uh, after the Wilderness Reclamation trigger untaps the lands. Yep. Going to float some mana here. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, if he fires off the one that has three counters, costs three to destroy, destroys both Deputy Detentions, which brings back two Deputy Detentions. And Search for Escanta. Yeah, and the Search for Escanta removes everything that Shouta uh, Shout has in play. And Shouta has a deputy of detention. In his it's, hand. This is this is the craziest deputy. Game. It's it's like it's like deputy. They're they're sheriff's deputies, and they're yeah. literally just going out there. It's like I didn't uh, shoot the sheriff, but I shot a lot uh, of deputies. I really did. There were so many. Growth chamber guardian going to be the draw for well, Shouta. And and the, the the crazy thing here is the second blast zone draw. Right. This this deputy detention. Well, you can hit these deputy detentions, but that blast zone can just go off again on deputy detention and just reset to where we are. So it looks like uh, that deputy is going to take uh, maybe the wilderness reclamation here. Mm. Okay, yeah, I, I think that hitting hitting something here that is not deputy detention is going to be what Shouts is looking to do because uh, you know just like we were saying, the blast zone would allow those deputies to uh, to just come back. So not really going to cut it. But this this does leave Shouta with the growth chamber guardian that can become a four four against two things that can't block it. Right. But again, blast zone. And here we've got uh, Nelson. Nelson is still at two life, uh, crucially. This is, mm -hmm. uh, he has to be really careful about how many attackers are still on the board, how he uses his blast zone. Uh, probably going to be very important here. So it looks like Wilderness Reclamation is going to be the target for Shota's Deputy of Detention. Blast zone going to put, uh, looks like a counter on there. Mm -hmm. Search for his Kanta. Triggers. Search for his Kanta to the graveyard, draws a card. It is a Glacial Fortress. And now, you know, the, the Blast Zone is an interesting decision for Brad at this point, because if he doesn't Blast Zone now, there is the threat of the, uh, the Growth Chamber Guardian uh, getting more Growth Chamber Guardians. So Brad is, uh, has dragged Tamiyo Collector of Tales out to the battlefield, hovering over it, thinking, do I want to cast this right now? I don't have my Wilderness Reclamation. Going to cast the Tamiyo Collector of Tales. And going to choose a non-land name. What is he going to look for? Looking for... I really hope... Deputy of Detention. <laughs> Got a theme to this game. Uh, yeah, it looks does not like... Find one. Does not Interestingly, there's only a single copy left in his deck, right? Because there's, there's a... There are... Uh, oh, no, there's, there's two more copies. There are two more copies. I was, I was, I was looking, at, uh, I was looking yep. at Shouta's Graveyard in the bottom left there, thinking that was one in Brad's deck. All right, back to Shota. Grill Chamber Bar Guardian going to get in here. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Brad must block. So I, I think part of the, the, the sort of Tamiyo there was actually he's looking to... to uh, just fill up his graveyard for that search for Escanta. Sure. So he specifically, he may even just wanted to miss um, in order to ensure that his graveyard gets big enough. He's going to have to chump block with this deputy of detention here. Gives back the uh, incubation druid, which crucially is another two cost creature. So his blast zone will be able to deal with uh, the incubation druid and the growth chamber guardian. And he's going to flip the search for Escanta, so he'll be able to fire off that blast zone safely. Growth Chamber Guardian, of course, not going to get committed to the board uh, due to the fact that that Blast Zone is on two. Yeah, and, and you know, crucially, again, that Growth Chamber Guardian represents more creatures that are all lethal. So Brad's really uh, in a precarious position here. Search for Skanta, though, will flip this turn. And uh, you know, obviously, in addition to uh, 
becoming a Scott of the Sunken Ruin, it is no longer a two-cost non-land permanent, so it is no longer vulnerable to getting blown up by that blast zone. Right. Sun Petal Grove is the draw for Brad Nelson. Uh, not going to be a huge amount of help here at the moment when he's facing down, uh, facing down a Growth Chamber Guardian in hand that can continue to grab other copies of itself from Shota's deck. Looks like Brad is going to uh, plus Tamio here. Maybe we could take a look, see what he's going to get. Oh no, minusing. All right. Hovering over to Fairy Hero of Dominaria. Yeah, the Fairy gives him an immediate answer if he doesn't want to have to use the Blast Zone. He can also just go digging and uh, start drawing cards and keeping himself with that Blast Zone up. I believe he has enough mana to do that. Hovering Deputy of Detention now. Really, this has been the game of Deputy of Detention. Really has. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, there we go. Oh, okay, there it is. Another one. There it is. <laughs> Deputy of Detention going to come in and my guess is get back his yeah. Wilderness Reclamation. Yep. Might as well play the land here. Want to float some extra mana. Yeah, and now you know he has the Wilderness Reclamation uh, along with the Blast Zone and Ascanta. So he you know, is able to just activate the Ascanta now and then still have both it and Blast Zone up and available. All right, going to draw Growth Spiral off of Ascanta the Sunken Ruin. Float a white and a blue with m much mana in play at his end step. Another blue. Just blowing him up. Looks like Blast Zone is going to go off here. Kaboom. Incubation Druid and Growth Chamber Guardian say goodbye. We were unfortunately within the Blast Zone. Shota draws a Breeding Pool and commits a Growth Chamber Guardian to the battlefield, paying two life for a Breeding Pool to come into play untapped. Looking through the graveyard, yeah, looking it. at the things on the battlefield. Growth Spiral is going to be cast by Nelson. Nelson draws a Hallowed Fountain. We'll probably put it onto the battlefield tapped. As Count of the Sunken Ruin at the end of Nelson's turn, going to find Nexus of Fate. And, and yeah, one of the really awkward things is Tamio can just get back those Blast Zones. He can just minus the Tamio to get back Blast Zones. So if Shouto were to have used his Growth Chamber Guardian to just get another copy, put it into play, it's like, okay, I'll just kill both of them. Right. So the, you know, the, the Tamio is, is really uh, you know, providing Brad with a lot of utility here, you know, just having access to his graveyard. And he's gonna go find Tamio into a new Tamio. Looks like. And when you have when you have so much mana to work with with the Wilderness Reclamation, you know this is just this is just so powerful, right? You know you're able to Tamio get another Tamio into play. Now you have Reclamation plus Nexus of Fate. You you know your opponent has nothing here essentially. You can go get Teferi if you want. You can get kind of snare. <laughs> Root snare it looks sure. like is the saying. Hey, In go ahead. In case something me. goes wrong. Yeah has one turn to turn things around. Uh, well, yeah, no, nope. he, he doesn't have any turns, right? Because the <laughs> Nexus of Fate is coming. He's going to activate the Ascanta. Can he find a second Nexus? That... Let's find out. Yes, yep. he can. There's the second Nexus of Fate. And uh, Brad Nelson showing off what Nexus of Fate Bant does best, which is take a lot of extra turns. Let's do the Nexus of Fate again. <laughs> that's how the time goes, right? Uh, two Nexus uh -huh. of Fates on the Iskanta activation. So yep. Brad is uh, is and right in the yeah, middle of the next eye. The good Shot game is like, all right, I've seen enough. Brad Band. Nelson winning with Bant Nexus. Wow. Beautifully done. That is such a complicated, intricate deck, and to what it's like a it's like a ballet. Oh, there's a lot going on. There's a lot <laughs> going on there, certainly. And uh, yeah, I really think that the the superstar of that game uh, was Blast Zone. Absolutely. We, we, we or saw deputy of detention. Well, <laughs> deputy of detention. The game. You know, there's a lot of deputy of detention stuff going back and forth. But the, the game that made or the card that rather that made it so possible for Brad to to take over that game from a very precarious position was the blast zone because you know, he was able to uh, use the wilderness reclamation to just you know fire off the the blast zones like in kind of uh, kind of uh, 
consecutive turns, just or even the same turn, he played it, right? Uh, just to, to blow up everything that Shouta had for offense. I mean, it's hard to say which turn was Brad's and then which turn <laughs> was also Brad's. I think consecutive turns is kind of meaningless <laughs> when they're all just like one long string of Brad's <laughs> exactly. turns. I mean, it, you, you can see why Blast Zone has been an inclusion in a lot of those yeah. Nexus builds, right? It's, it's such a great utility land to just make sure you, you have more outs to win the game. When we talked in the first game, it's like, okay, well, it's really really important for Brad to have ways to deal with, you know, the Fairy Time Raveler and to deal with this and to deal with this. It's like the way to deal with any of those is Blast Zone. Notably, Blast Zone, an ability, not an instant. So uh, gets around to Fairy Time Raveler yes. pretty nicely. Yes, pretty All nicely. Right. Now what we want to do for you guys is recap some of the other Emerald Division matches. So we're just going to talk about them, and we've got a head-by-head -head here. This is... Grzegorz Kowalski and Very Alexander nice. Hain. I worked nice. on it. I worked on the pronunciation <laughs> there. So uh, we've got just a little summary of what happened here. Uh, we have Grzegorz with his bant mid range, and then Alexander Hain with the mono, mono red. And uh, let's see. So that that mono red uh, it was really a highlight reel for experimental frenzy. You get that card out, and just everything you draw can sometimes just go in your favor. Yeah, in the first game there were a lot of uh, interesting th uh, opportunities for Kowalski with his uh, his bant deck, but the experimental frenzy really had a couple of uh, big turns that ended up finishing him off. And then in the second game, uh, despite Cyberdy and some uh, some some you know removal effects, uh, the the mid range deck just really couldn't deal with the efficient mono red creatures from uh, from Hain, and uh, Hain was able to win the match two games to zero. Yeah, very impressive win from Hain there. Uh, but Krovalski did very well last week, so you know maybe maybe he's learning a little. He brought that Demir deck last week, and then uh, the Bant as well this week, as well as everyone else who brought Bant this week. <laughs> popular deck this week, so for sure. Maybe very he'll popular. be reconsidering mm -hmm. which deck to bring in the future. We'll see, or maybe he's going to try with the Bant some more. But uh, yeah, an impressive win from Hain there. Yes. We have another uh, recap match we want to show you guys. This is Yuza, Martin Yuza, and Yasuo Oka again. Yeah, this is actually a, a match uh, that was a uh, sort of makeup match from last week. Uh, you know, the, the, this is why the players are you know playing different decks. We just showed that he wasn't playing uh, Sultai mid range; he was playing Bant. Uh, but these, this was a, a match the players couldn't quite find a time to schedule last week, so it was played going into this week. And uh, in the the first game, uh, it was just kind of a blowout. Uh, Shota never had a second land, and if you've ever played against Mono Red and missed a land drop, you know how that works. Feels extremely bad. That's how it works. Uh, and it looks like Yuza came back from nothing against Yasuoka's Ten Life, and Ugin with a Rekindling Phoenix, and of course everybody's favorite. Tybalt uh, and some devil tokens. That rakish instigator. <laughs> I don't know if I'd say of course when it's like, oh, of course he won with Tybalt. That's not really something people think, right? Like, people think it people all the time. It just doesn't happen. But uh, cr crucially, <laughs> uh, you know, Tybalt does have the power of shutting down the life gain from Wild Growth Walker, which right. can be a huge problem in a long game against a deck like Sultai Midrange. So, you know, that uh, the, the, the demons, sure, they're 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 you know part of it there, but uh, that that card's more in the sideboard in order to stop those big life gain effects. Yeah. Mm -hmm, definitely. Now we have another another summary of this entire division. So let's hop over to that now. Hello everybody, I'm Corbin Hostler here to break down the super week here in the Emerald Division for you. First of all, Seth Manfield knocked out Christian Hauk in the mono red mirror. There was some pretty crazy back and forth dancing between Chandra Fire Artisans. It's the War of the Spark Planeswalker that no one wants on the board, but no one really wants to kill either, thanks to the uh, the static ability on that Planeswalker. Uh, in the end, Seth knocked out Hauk in three close games. Manfield kept it up from there, knocking off fellow Hall of Famer Shota Yasuoka 2-1 to one as his red deck was able to run over God Eternal Oketra just in time. That gave Seth his second win of the week and means he's perfect so far this split. Joining him at the top is Martin Yuza, who had a very busy week. In addition to winning the match you saw against Yasuoka, uh, he also took Alexander Hain in a mono red mirror and took down a third match this week against Matt Nass, who fell to Kowalski. But here's what you need to know. Martin Yuza, Seth Manfield, Brad Nelson. They're all off to perfect 3-0 starts and lead the way here in the Emerald Division for the War of the Spark split after two weeks of play. Matt Nass and Shada Yasuoka represent the other end of that. They're 0-3. But hey, in a field like this, the field as strong as the MPL, look, there's always gonna be somebody who has to go 0-3, right? And in this case, just happens to be those two. So we're seeing some early separation here in the Emerald Division. Now, I know it's only a few games in, but the more distance the players at the top can put between themselves and the rest of the field right now, the better off it'll be for them in the long run. Brad and Helson, Seth Manfield, Marnuza, all off to great starts at the top. They're pacing the way 
here in the Emerald Division. We've got a lot of great weeks ahead of us, so I'm really excited to see uh, where this division goes from here. You know what, Brian? I'm going to do something unpredictable, and I'm going to say Brad Nelson's going to win this division <laughs> after all. Yeah, he was number two on that list. I'm on your strategy. They I'm on your strategy. Three and take take someone who hasn't lost and say they're going to win. I'm mm. just impressed with the, the use of, of that deck we just saw. It just blew me away. Um, Brad Nelson is a very impressive player. Yeah, Brad, Brad is an extremely strong player. In, in particular, you know, his, his flexibility to play a wide variety of deck types, as I was mentioning going into that match. You know, a, a lot of players have a style, and they stick to it. I'm one of those players, frankly. I, I like to play my, my mid-range green creature decks, you know? <laughs> Uh, people, people like uh, BM Kibler. Does that mean you're bad mid? No, it's Brian Midrange Kibler. That's what it means. <laughs> it's not actually my middle name, but no. Uh, but and you know, your part elf. I should mention. <laughs> there you go. Mm -hmm. It's it's hidden under the the headphones. Mm -hmm. All right. So now we're gonna look at our final division, and this is the Sapphire Division, and uh, we have a very interesting matchup uh, that we'll get to in a bit. But I think we have a graphic of this division overall. Ooh, yeah. Oh, no, the Emerald standings one more time, just so we can... Uh, we saw it in that recap. But here they are again. In yeah. case you didn't see it. Yeah, no. And you <laughs> want to hear us talking over okay, it. Okay, I guess I did Here's pick whoever was on top. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's first in this list, so your strategy remains unchanged. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, I... I you know, like we were just saying, Brad Nelson, a fantastic player. Uh, Seth Minfield, we haven't really seen play too much in these first couple of weeks, but you know, he's a player who, I, I like to joke, hasn't stopped winning ever since I stopped really competing on the, uh, at the top level of Magic. You got yeah, out at the right I, time. I, I, apparently, because that's just been mowing him down ever since I uh, ever since I stopped competing uh, regularly, uh, along with uh, Martin Yuza, who is a uh, world traveler who gets to play from home now. Uh, really topping off this division. And seeing Shota at the bottom there, it hurts me because I'm so impressed with how quickly he plays. You know, it, it's just the, the the glance of a color and he knows what he's gonna play. <laughs> yeah, he, he has like sort of a, a preternatural ability to just understand what he wants to do in any given situation. Yeah, like oftentimes, uh, especially playing live, it can throw his opponents off. You know, you, you're, you're, you're trying to like kind of keep up in the pace with him and it's impossible because there's no way you're making decisions, you know, at the sort of pace that he is. Right, of course, you wanna match the energy of what your opponent has and you have to say, no, I'm allowed to go slow. Don't you put that on me. Okay. <laughs> well, my way. Well, before Land. we get into Land the Sapphire Ralph. Division, we yeah. are going to take a little break. Okay. Oh. So now it's time to relax. Make sure you stay tuned. And remember that after the MPL Weekly, we are going to go back to coverage of Magic Online Championship. So make sure you never, ever get take your, se your seat out of your seat. See you in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> the exception. <laughs> 